Hello, Christian Life Fellowship and others who have joined with us today. I'm very thankful that you're spending this time with us, and I pray that you are encouraged in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be picking up again today in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to be picking up at verse 21, and we're going to go through verse 24. I've titled this message, The Christian Family, Marriage, Part 1. But before we do that, let's just bow our heads and pray. Will you join me? My God, Father, and Savior, I come before you this day, O merciful and gracious Father, and find in myself in great need. I'm, I'm in need of your divine spirit. I'm in need of your divine word. I'm in need of your divine wisdom, guidance, and protection. I'm in need of your strength. Heavenly Father, I need your beloved Son in whom I find all that I may need to be satisfied. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you that our lives are hid in Jesus to the praise of his glorious name. The psalmist prayed, Father, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. And you attended his prayer. Father, the hymn reminds us of the desperation of our need. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, O oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, as I come to Thee. Father, in the name of Your Son, I thank You that You meet our needs. You give us your spirit. You give us your word. You give us your wisdom, your guidance, and your direction. And you give us our, our strength in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that you bless the proclamation of your word. May your word go forth to its intended target. May your name be honored. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to, to chapter 5? We're going to begin with verse 21. <clears throat> Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. <clears throat> now as the church submits to Christ so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. You know, God has a lot to say about marriage. God has a lot to say about the Christian family, our homes. In the Bible, we find that God created and He blessed marriage. God designed and planned marriage between one man and one woman. God has a perfect and successful plan for marriage. Marriage is a holy institution. John Stott summarizes well what the Bible, Bible's idea is for marriage. He says, Marriage is an exclusive heterosexual covenant between one man and one woman, ordained and sealed by God, preceded by the leaving of parents, consummated in sexual union, issuing in a permanent, mutually supportive partnership, and normally crowned with the gift of children. Yeah, I think that, that says it well. However, since the beginning of time, the enemy of the cross has attempted to destroy this holy institution. What God designed as holy, and it is. Satan works to make it unholy. We have witnessed just 
over the past 60 years in our country, the enemy's all-out assault against the family, which we call the cultural war. This assault comes from places such as our judicial system, with laws written to redefine marriage, and from organizations such as the feminist movement, who has taken so much away from women. The influence and impact that such laws and organizations have had are a disgrace and a perversion of God's wonderful and intended plan for marriage and for the home. So we understand that there is a cultural war against the family and marriage. But we also understand that more than a cultural war, this is a spiritual war. This is a spiritual war that's going on around us. When it comes to the standard and the function of the church, I'm talking to the church now, our focus and concern as Christians should be, are we his church living according to the commands of Jesus Christ? Are we filled with and walking with the Spirit? Are we accomplished in these areas of spiritual disciplines and virtue? Are we doing what we have been called to do first and foremost as the church? Galatians 5.25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. We need to concern ourselves first and foremost with, Are we obedient? Are we obedient to the command set forth by Jesus, who is the head of the church, and that of being the church? Oh, we, we, we cannot miss this. We, we can't miss what Paul is instructing us here. The Holy Spirit actually instructing us here. And, and we may think we've heard it a thousand times, and you probably have as Christians, if you've been in the church for any amount of time. I'm sure you've heard messages on the family and on marriage. But it's, it's always good to be refreshed in, in the Word. And we can't miss this. We, we need to embrace these truths. We left off last week, last time we were together, in Ephesians 5.21, where we are introduced to the principle of submission. So in 5.21, Paul first mentions submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Believers whose lives have been filled by God's Spirit will be marked by submission within divinely ordered relationships. The key verb used here means literally arrange under, uh, submit to one another, subject to one another. Literally means to arrange under. It regularly functioned to describe the submission of someone in an ordered array to another person who was above the first in some way. For example, the submission of soldiers in an army to those of superior rank. Our mutual submissiveness is out of reverence for Christ. We submit to one another because we first have submitted to Christ by coming to the knowledge and truth of Christ at the cross. He has forgiven us of our sins as we have asked Him to forgive us. And He's made us a child of God. And that is our first form of submission to Him by accepting Him. And so out of reverence for Christ, we experience this mutual submission, submissiveness in the body of Christ with each other. One commentator says, some have argued that mutual submission is illogical, which it is, if viewed apart from Christ. However, if we understand the gospel, mutual submission makes perfectly good sense. What Paul has in mind is that Christians reject self-centeredness and work for the good of others. Submission is nothing more than a decision about the relative worth of others. Loving others more than we love ourselves. Looking out for the interest of others more than our own interest. Those are biblical virtues. Those, and it takes biblical discipline to be a disciple of those virtues. This commentator goes on to say, our society emphasizes equality. 
But mutual submission is a much stronger idea than equality. With equality, you still have a battle of rights. And equality can exist without love, but it will not create a Christian community. With mutual submission, we give up rights and support each other. Mutual submission is to support each other. Mutual submission is love in action. The love of God at work in us in action. It brings equal value in to one another. Equal value in to one another. The cross of Jesus Christ brings us all to level ground. Now, I want to make sure that as we look at what Paul is instructed in verses 21 and following, that we do not view these as one being more important than the other, or that we can do one and not do the other. <laughs> and you'll find that as we quickly move into verse 22, 23, 24, 25. The submitting to one another, wives to their husbands, husbands, uh, the head of the wife is Christ as head of the church, and children obeying their parents. These are areas of individual and corporate obedience. Individual and corporate obedience. We are to view them and embrace them for what they truly are. That is, uh, in obedience to the command to submit to one another, and as we'll see in a moment, wives submitting to their own husbands. When we are in obedience to the command, we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Individual and corporate obedience brings us to the to be conformed to the image of Christ, in conformity to the image of Christ in the church and in our families and in the marriage relationship. In 1 John 4, 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves is born of God and knows God. Let us love one another, for love is from God and whoever has loves has been born of God and knows God. Knowing the love of God and loving others with the love of God is our assurance that we are children of God. You know, this is an affirm and assist for us. And it'll guide us into all that we are commanded to do. When we are affirmed in the love of God, freely expressing the commandment to love one another. What freedom. I, I think that, personally, I believe that a lot of people in the church today, we are so restrained in ourselves from truly loving and reaching out to people. And I know in this pandemic season that we are in with all the social distancing, uh, don't, don't you love the picture that that gives us when we talk about the enemy's assault against the church and family? Let's keep them apart. You know, let's, let's keep them at a distance. Yeah. I know with all of that, we were thinking, well, we, we can't even shake hands. We can't give a brother or a sister a hug in the Lord. And we've got to stay the distance. But, but listen, we are still affirmed in the love of God. And we can still love and encourage one another today. And we'll do more so later on when we can come back together. So following verse 21, Paul, Paul is going to touch on three areas concerning the principle of submission. And these three areas of marriage that we find here in verses 22 to 33, the home that we'll find in chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, and in the work environment in chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. So Paul, we are brought now to verse 22. Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. You, you will notice how intimately verse 22 is linked with verse 21. Paul takes the principle of submission into the marriage relationship, saying to wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. This is a command, by the way, to the wife. This is a command, as was the command to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul is now saying and commanding, this is an obligation to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Harry Ironside, a wonderful minister, theologian, and his commentary says, in the revised version, it's a translation of the Bible, you'll see that the words submit yourselves are in italics and correctly so. That means that they are not found in the best manuscripts. Let us read it exactly, exactly as it is in the Greek. 
he says. And it reads like this in the Greek. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives unto your own husbands, husbands loving your wives. And Mr. Ironside makes the point saying, he, referring to God, he is not calling upon the wife to take the place of a slave. She often takes that place in pagan lands. But he is calling for it, and he's going to give three things here that I think are really important for us to catch. He says, but he is calling for, God is calling for mutual loyalty, mutual respect, and mutual submission. God is calling for mutual loyalty, mutual respect, and mutual submission. Um, and I think that just gives us a wonderful insight and definition as we are dealing with this text of Scripture. I want to take us to, into another area of it right now. The text teaches that there is a divinely given order in marriage, in the marriage relationship, and it uses the word submit, which is an incendiary word in today's Western culture. We live in an age of liberation. To talk about submission today is seen as countercultural and suggests to, for many to be considered like oppression, subjugation, or dominance. In discussing the subject, such as I am doing, one runs the risk of being misunderstood and taken completely out of context. We don't want to do that today. I, I, don't want to take, I don't want myself to be taken out of context, and I certainly do not want to take the Word of God out of context. I, I, I know that God has a word for us today, and I'm careful to, to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed and rightly divided in the word of truth. And, and I pray that God will just fill your hearts with his wonderful truth and word, with what, he's, what Paul is instructing with us today. So yes, this age of liberation, and we've seen, we've seen through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, up to our present day, several different waves of feminism uh, in our country calling women out and and well I, I don't really want to get into all of that but all I can say is this that God God has given women a beautiful and great position in the family unit just like she like he has the husband and the man and we need to pay attention to what God's word has to say and again be deaf to the sounds and noises of the world around us as they try to draw you away. The words wives submit to, or in some translations it says be subject to, comes from, the, from a Greek word which means to relinquish one's rights and emphasizes the willing submitting of oneself. To relinquish one's rights and emphasizes the willing submitting of oneself, the willingness on our part or the wife's part. God's command is to those who are to submit. This, that is, the submission is to be a voluntary response to God's will in giving up one's independent rights to other believers in general and to ordained authority in particular. In this case, the wife's own husband. Ephesians 5.22 should not be offensive or incendiary to the church and especially to Christian women. If you're offended by this, let me suggest it is because you have the wrong view concerning what Paul is teaching here. It is important for us to keep in mind that Paul's instruction about the duties of both husband and wife have to be understood in light of his instruction concerning Christ and the church. It needs to be understood, what is being said here, uh, Paul's instruction, in light of his instruction concerning Christ and the church. And down in verse 32 of Ephesians 5, it says, the mystery is profound. It's a profound mystery. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, it is not a mystery that a husband and wife should love each other. That's not a mystery. As a matter of fact, that's a wonderful thing, and I think that's a good thing. I'll go even a step further. I think that's a great thing for marriage, don't you? 
I, I think it's right that a wife loves her husband and that a husband loves her wives according to the Word of God. And let me tell you, when we, when we finally get to that definition, oh, what a deep love that is. What a love for each other we, have, we should have. But it is, however, a mystery in which the husband and wife coming together as one demonstrates Christ's relationship to his church, to that of the world around us. The mystery, says Paul, says the Holy Spirit, is that this refers to Christ and his bride, the church. Here we're talking about that oneness. I mentioned that, the husband and wife, that relationship, that consummation of the relationship, bringing them as one. We are one in Christ. In Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 16, <clears throat> it says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. This states that in Christ, Jew and Gentile together make up the body of Christ. These two races were in or are in opposition to each other aside from being in Christ. And they are far from God outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. But in and through the cross, in his flesh, Jesus became our sacrifice. He broke down the wall of hostility to make one out of the two Thus, they are no longer Jew and Gentile. They are the body of Christ. They are called Christians. They are one society, says John Stott. So it doesn't matter what part of the world you live in, what color your skin is, what language you speak. If you have been born again and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are Asian, you are European, you are North American, you are a Christian. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and we belong as a whole to the body of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful picture of the church in operation in our world today. Unless you can prove yourself to be of a Jewish lineage, then you are a sinful Gentile. Those are the two categories we find in Scripture. Well, I'm not Jewish. We love the Jewish nation. We do. But if we are not Jewish people by our ancestry, by our lineage, then we are sinful Gentiles. And that's exactly what you and I were before we came to Jesus Christ. We were unsaved, uncircumcised Gentiles. But when we come to Jesus Christ, those who put their faith in Christ, Paul says they are the true Jewish people. We are one nation. We are Christians. People from all walks of life. And on every continent broken and sinful people. Yet in the Savior, in Jesus, we have been made new. We've been made new. That's good news for us. And making up the body of Jesus Christ. This is referring to Christ and the body. The NIV says it very well. It says, verse 32 of chapter 5, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. We find again in verse 531, keeping that thought of that oneness working in your heart and in your mind. In verse 31 of chapter 5, Paul is quoted in the Old Testament book, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. 
beautiful picture of that oneness and helping us to understand this oneness that we're talking about and what we were talking about here in Ephesians 2, 13 and 16 of which Christ in the sacrifice of his body broke down the, 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 the hot wall of hostility that stood between peoples. He's brought us together. Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 to 30, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> if you're a child of God, Jesus knows you. He knows you. And He wants you to hear His voice. Oh, what an assurance that should fill your heart with. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, Jesus said, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Uh, that, that's just wonderful. I give them eternal life, they'll never perish, and, and no one can ever take them out of my hand. My Father who has given to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Think about that. If no one can snatch us out of Christ's hand and, and Christ has given us eternal life, we're not going to perish. We're secure in Him. How much more are we in the hand of the Father? Then Jesus says here, He says, I and the Father are one. We are one. In His high priestly prayer, Jesus is praying for His disciples in John chapter 17 and in verse 11. And He says, Holy Father, keep them in Your name which You have given Me that they may be one even as we are one. Jesus desires that for His disciples, that they too would experience that oneness with the Father that He has with the Father. And again, Jesus not only prays for His disciples, but for all who, all, all who will believe in Him as Savior and Lord. Jesus prays in John 17, verses 20 to 21. He says, I do not ask for these only, meaning His disciples, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word. Jesus was looking into 2020. He was looking at all of us today who make up the church of Jesus Christ who have heard the word of their testimony and we have believed and received the gospel of truth. Jesus says, but for the, also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our demonstration of the oneness of Jesus Christ and in the body of Christ and even in our marital relationships speaks volumes to the world concerning the truth and knowledge of Jesus Christ so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Oh, Jesus is true. Jesus is a realized reality. He is not just historical. He is living today. He is alive and He is well. And we, the church, testify to that truth in what we do and in how we live. In Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, Make it known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth or in the earth. In this uniting of all things, He does that through this oneness principle that we are reading and studying about here in Ephesians. Jesus is uniting all things in Him, things in heaven and things in and earth. We are here on this earth in our physical existence, but we know our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and He who transcends time and eternity makes Himself one with us by giving to us of His Holy Spirit, that even now in this life we experience our eternal joy, our eternal inheritance, because we have the presence of God with us. We have the Word of God with us. He is united in all things in Himself, things in heaven and things on the earth. So marriage, marriage is a magnificent and powerful demonstration of Christ's covenant love, namely with His bride, the church. In His church is a magnificent and powerful demonstration of Christ's 
covenant love. Understand in this, Christ's covenant love for his church brings a much greater significance to marriage than most of us can imagine. Oh, there's so much to this. And, uh, sometimes I feel that, man, I, I've, I've missed so much of this. Missed so much of it, but today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day, the day of awareness. Today is the day of God's truth to penetrate our hearts and that we live anew in Him, refreshed, proclaiming His truth to the world around us. So again, I say it's important for us to keep in mind that Paul's instruction about the duties of both husband and wife have to be understood in light of his instruction concerning Christ and the church. This is also a reminder that our identity as believers is not tied to being either married or single, but it is being made first of all in the image of God and then being remade by the power of the Holy Spirit in and through the work of Jesus Christ. Our first, first move here is to be made, we are made in the image of Christ and then we are remade in the birth, the second birth, coming to know Jesus Christ by the power of His Holy Spirit. As Christians, as Christians, we need to understand marriage as being formed in this way. The church, the church must lose its identity in any form of association with the world status and embrace these eternal and life-changing truths. So, so the world may make laws, they may redefine marriage, and they will. There's going to be a lot more persecution against the church, against the family, against marriage. It's going to come. The church must be identified with upholding the rich and eternal truths of God's Word. Are you going to falter in the day? Are you going to falter in the heat of battle? We, the church, are to stand upon the promise of God's Word, upon the truth of God's Word, and we must live it each and every day in opposition to the world's onslaught. So why should the wife submit to her own husband? I, I feel like I just went from real low, low gear to, to high gear here. That's all right. Why should the wife submit to her husband? It's because of her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The wife, as a born-again believer, is submitted first to Christ, first to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit says that when she submits to her husband as a result of the command, she is submitting to the Lord. I, I find that this is the only way the wife can possibly submit to her husband that is, if she can first submit to Christ. Ladies today, Christian women, some of you may be thinking, oh, I, I can never be that. I can never do that. And what you are saying is that you have a, a short-term ride on the road to submit to Christ. That you have a limitation in front of you that you will never fully submit to Christ. You see, this is what that's a reflection of. I'm not picking on you, ladies. I'm affirming you in Christ. I'm affirming you in God's Word. In verse 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. This is a wonderful picture of, oh, I guess you could say a marriage made in heaven. A marriage made in heaven. With God's blessing upon the marriage. With that man and woman being born again as Christians, that marriage will be a marriage made in heaven. If these two people learn mutual submission one to the other. Jesus is the head of the church, his body. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. As the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. What a contrast. Oh, I, that, that's almost scary for us men to be in that contrast 
not in contrast, I should say, to be identified, rather, not contrast, be identified with Christ in the marriage relationship. John MacArthur says, Christ not only is the head of the church, but its fullness. Since he has such a unique and intimate relationship with the redeemed whom he loves, all his power will be used in their behalf to fulfill his love and purpose for them. He is completely over us and completely in us. Our supreme Lord and supreme power. The church is the fullness or complement of Christ. As a head must have a body to manifest the glory of that head, so the Lord must have the church to manifest his glory. Jesus Christ fills all in all, given his fullness to believers. But in God's wisdom and grace, believers as a church are also the fullness of Christ. Verse 24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. The wife, as a Christian, we've said this already, is a member of the body of Christ. She is a spirit-filled, she is spirit-filled, thus she abides in Christ as a child of God, as being filled with the Spirit, she abides in Christ. Her loyalty and allegiance is first and foremost to her Savior, Jesus Christ, and as a member of the body of Christ. This position in Christ has equipped her to submit to her husband. It's equipped you to submit to a husband. In 1 John 4.13 it says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. He has given us of his spirit, it, it says. He's given us of his Holy Spirit. As this godly wife follows and submits to Christ, she can also submit, submit to the leadership of her godly husband. Key word there, godly. Godly wife, godly husband. So what does it mean to submit in everything? It means submit in every area of life. It does not mean she follows him in matters that are sinful. So a wife is not to be obedient to Christ, but yet be in obedience by following her husband into sin. She does not have to do that. Everything that is right, everything that is good, everything that is true, that is the pattern we follow. And you can follow that godly man you can, in everything, knowing that he's going to protect you, knowing that he's going to provide for you and love you like Christ. So the husband has an obligation here as well to live godly and represent Christ to his wife and to his family. Tony Merida, uh, a wonderful theologian and commentator that I read, he calls verses 23 to 24 the illustration. He says this, Paul speaks of marriage as a picture of Christ's love for the church in verses 23 to 24 and carries it into verses 25 to 32. Paul shows us that marriage displays the gospel. The Old Testament also illustrated God's love for his people with, with a marriage. In this text, it is Christ and the church specifically. In verse 32, Paul says this picture is profound. It is awesome. In creation, God had Christ and the church in mind. Consider these three applications of this picture. And he gives three applications, which I want to share with you quickly. First, this illustration gives us the ultimate picture of marriage. Wives give a picture of the church to the world. Husbands give a picture of Christ to the world. Christ is the head, as noted in Ephesians 1, 22. Second, this illustration gives us the ultimate purpose of marriage, namely, the glory of Christ. The ultimate purpose of our marriages is to bring glory to Christ. Everything in this passage points us to Christ. As to the Lord in verse 22, as Christ loved the church in verse 25, as Christ does for the church in verse 29, everything comes back to Christ. 
And third, he says this illustration provides amazing hope for marriage. Christ died for the church, which displayed her sinfulness and his saving grace. The ultimate problem in marriage is sin. The ultimate solution is the grace of Jesus. Marriage is intended to point us to Jesus. In that mutual submissiveness of the marital relationship and in the church, we are to love one another as we love the Lord, as unto the Lord. We are to be the example of Jesus Christ to one another and the world around us will see that love, that affection, that care being demonstrated in the home, in the family, in the marriage to bring glory to Christ. Yes, the, the, the ultimate problem in marriage is sin. The ultimate solution is grace in Jesus. In conclusion, I want to tell you there is hope for the Christian family and marriages today. We have God's Word instructing us on how to serve Him, serve one another, serve our spouses in that submissive submissiveness. And not only are our individual lives to proclaim Jesus to the world, but our marriages and family are to do the same. Oh, that the world will see Jesus in our lives in our marriages, and in our families. We need to embrace this. We need to get this. It doesn't matter how many years you've been married. It doesn't matter if you're just newly married. We need to embrace these truths while there is hope in the day. This is what it means, I believe, to walk in the Spirit. And it takes us back to verse 10 of chapter 5. This is pleasing to the Lord. May you know that joy and that peace that comes in glorifying Christ in and through your life. May you walk in His Word today, walk in the Spirit today, trust in the Lord, look into Him to lead you and to guide you. Let Him fill your need today. Amen.